Today, Member of Parliament of APNU AFC, the Honorable Mr. Roysdale Ford, issued a statement to the press in which he made a number of allegations of unconstitutionality against the PPPC administration in relation to the presentation of the 2020 budgetary estimates and expenditures. And I feel compelled to respond to the contentions made by Mr. Ford. And perhaps a convenient point to begin is to remind the Guyanese people that Mr. Ford was very much part of that legal team who have been advising the APNU AFC in government over the past five years. And the Guyanese people would be familiar with the type of advice that came from that team of which Mr. Ford was in part, was a part. Uh, in my budget presentation, I detailed the desecration and violations which they have done to the rule of law and the Constitution repeatedly over the past five years while in government. For example, the argument that quickly comes to mind is the argument that 33 is not a majority of 65 and their bizarre interpretation of the Constitution in relation to the election chairman's appointment, as well as the innumerable strange, befuddling, and outrageous interpretation which they have placed upon the Constitution in order to justify their numerous egregious violations of that sacred document over the past five years. One cannot also forget the melee of madness, that is, that five-month period subsequent to the March the second elections, where Mr. Ford was leader of that team that filed a series of useless, frivolous, abusive, and asinine litigation in their efforts to thwart the will of the Guyanese people and in their efforts to steal the 2020 elections, the Yolita Moore case, the Riaz Holladar case, the David case, the public is well aware of the arguments advanced, the legal arguments advanced, how bizarre and outrageous they were, and how convincing they were presented in courts in the country. So I say that as my preambulatory remarks to remind the Guyanese people of the quality of legal interpretation that the likes of Mr. Ford produces. And I am not surprised, therefore, that Mr. Ford would make the contentions which he has made. So that's the first point I want to make. The second point I want to make is that it is the APNU AFC advised by Mr. Ford that caused the entire nation state of Guyana to careen off the constitutional tracks and made everything done in government illegal and unconstitutional by first their refusal to comply with the no confidence motion and comply with Article 106 and 107 of the Constitution and hold an elections within three months, cabinet refusing to resign as is mandated by the Constitution, and then remaining in government beyond that three months, taking the whole nation state of Guyana off the constitutional orbit and into an arena of unconstitutionality. 
after the, the March 2nd, 2020 elections, they did the very same and caused all the time frames fixed by the Constitution for the resumption of Parliament, the presentation of a budget to the Parliament, and parliamentary spending. All these things are regulated by the Constitution by expressly prescribed time frames because of the legal antics of Ford et al. and the ridiculous advice that they gave to the APNU AFC and the type of litigation that they were filing perpetually and consistently in order to delay the declaration of the results of the elections is what caused Guyana to be off the constitutional track and to be in a weird and unprecedented legal state. And now it is the PPP government that has to try as far as possible in almost impossible circumstance to bring back the ship of Guyana within the legal parameters of the constitution. And that is what we have been doing from the time we got into office. We never said that it is going to be an easy exercise. We never said that it may even be repairable. There are certain damages because of passage of time frames that we can't reverse. So we have to start at some point in time and try to bring regularity back into place, try to bring lawfulness back into place, and try to impose on governmental activities an aura of constitutionality. And that is what we have been doing in, a, in an extremely difficult circumstance and in an extraordinary atmosphere having regard to the prior violations pioneered by Ford et al. So it is really a joke that Roysdale Ford now, one of the architects of the unconstitutionality which we are confronted with, to now come and jump on some high legal horse to us in the PPP and the rest of the country about constitutional violation. This is a level of, of barefacedness that, you know, it's difficult to imagine unless you see it and hear it for yourself. That's the second point I want to make. And the third point I want to make is to assert positively that as far as was reasonably practicable, having regard to the antecedents of unconstitutionality, we in the People's Progressive Party Civic Administration have tried to comply with the Constitution. And that is our position which we hold tenaciously to. So let us deal with what Mr. Ford is speaking about. Now, the third point I want to make before I get into Ford's argument is that Mr. Ford is is basically new to the parliament. And I don't want to say fly by night, but he's new. And the provisions of the law that he's now confronted with and he's now reading and the articles in the constitution that he's now trying to understand are areas of the law that us who are seasoned parliamentarians have been reading interpreting and applying for a very long time. And we have precedents set on how these things are interpreted and how we apply them in the parliament. Parliament is governed by rules and procedures that are uniquely parliamentary. Parliament has a power to regulate its own process. It sets its own precedent. And also, parliament is guided by those precedents. And we have been doing it, even Ford's government, when they were in government, were trying to do it. So 
these things that he is now discovering, so to speak, are trite matters, settled matters. And, but he's reading it for the first time, so he gets all excited and rushes to the press and makes uninformed pronouncement. So his first um, allegation is that Article 219.3 of the Constitution was not complied with. And this guy has the audacity to say that we in the PPP are unaware of, the, of Article 219.3. When since we were in the opposition, we were saying from the opposition benches during those five months that we will be laying a statement of expenditures as is required by the Constitution in which we will disclose to the nation the monies that have been spent illegally and unconstitutionally and without parliamentary oversight by the APNU AFC government for the past five months. And here it is, Johnny come lately, is telling the nation that we are unaware of the existence of Article 219.3 and he takes credit for pointing us to Article 219.3. Sheer audacity. Anyhow, his interpretation of Article 219.3 is completely wrong. And I've issued a long statement explaining how he's wrong. Mr. Ford wants us to lay a statement of expenditure in compliance with 219.3 at the time when the budget estimates were laid. That is improper and it is wrong, that contention. 219.3 kicks in where there is no appropriation act and there has been spending. And that is the situation here. The law says that as soon as is reasonably practicable, the Minister of Finance, or one so designated by the President, must lay to it before the National Assembly the monies expended prior to the Appropriation Act. So we have an Appropriation Act that will come later tonight. So we have to, it's only now that we can lay the statement of excess, because if we lay it yesterday, then who would have accounted for the money that is spent today? If we lay it last week, who would have accounted for the money spent from last week to this week? The intention of the provision is to account for every dollar spent outside or prior to the Appropriation Act. Therefore, it is incumbent upon the Minister of Finance at the very last moment before the Appropriation Act is tabled to table that statement of expenditure so that it captures every dollar. Now, if Ford doesn't understand that, I can't help him. The second argument that Ford advances is that we have violated Section 80B2 of the Fiscal Management and Accountability Act because we have not laid um, the constitutional agency budget, that is, the audit office in the manner that it should have been laid. Now, as I said, we are dealing with a unique, unprecedented circumstance where a country has been running nine months without a budget. All the formalities cannot be complied with. Procedural requirements, all of them cannot be met. In this circumstance, you try to satisfy the main substance of the law. And if you can't comply with the, the, the procedural requirement, then you will have to necessarily ignore them. But what is the greater good? Getting the chairperson of the Public Accounts Committee, as the law says, to present the budget, budget of the audit office or to get the budget of the audit office presented. Mr. Ford's argument is that the requirement in the Constitution says that the chairman of the Public Accounts Committee must lay the budget in the Parliament. That is true. But we don't have a chairman of the Public Accounts Committee yet. The opposition themselves 
They are to chair it. They have not named, as far as I'm aware, a chairman of the public service, of the public accounts committee. They have not named that person. So are we to wait now until that procedural requirement is complied with and frustrate the substantive requirement of a budget for an important constitutional agency. That is the kind of inane nitpicking that Mr. Ford is engaged in. So it is a requirement that cannot be complied with in the exigent circumstances that we are faced with, caused by Mr. Ford and his irresponsible grouping of persons. So that is one of his arguments, a, a nonsensical argument. The second argument is that the schedule of the um, Fiscal Management and Accountability Act was not amended in time. Nothing was done in time. The budget is nine months late. I don't understand if, if, if Mr. Ford is sleeping. And nothing was done in time because his government squatted in office for over a year beyond their constitutional time. And then after they lost the election, they took another five months trying to steal the government. So yes, Mr. Ford, it is true that the schedule was not amended in time. But the fact is that the schedule was amended, and it was amended to reflect all the constitutional agencies whose budgets are being considered by the National Assembly. So because it wasn't done in time, that is a grand and great constitutional violation, does that compare with you and your cabal trying to steal the entire government in violation of the Constitution? So that's how I will treat with that argument. The other argument is that the local government commission, Mr. Ford argues, is a constitutional commission whose budget was not dealt with in the manner in which constitutional commissions' budgets are dealt with. It's a complete mischaracterization of the local government commission. Let me say up front that the local government commission is not a constitutional commission. In fact, the local government commission was established since 2015, appointed rather, since 2015 by Mr. Ford's government, AP and UAFC. And they never treated, they never treated the budget of that agency as a constitutional agency. Mr. Jordan, the finance minister, to his credit, was right when he never treated it as a constitutional agency, either in 2016, 2017, 2018. So why is the PPP required to treat it as a constitutional agency? But more importantly, it is not a constitutional agency. It is not a constitutional agency. Because the Constitution says, Article 78A of the Constitution says this, Parliament shall establish a local government commission. So that it's not every time the Constitution mentions a commission, it means that it's a constitutional commission. The Constitution says that Parliament will establish the commission. So it is a statutory commission. If, the con if it was a constitutional commission, the Constitution would have said there shall be a local government commission established by this constitution. It doesn't say so. It says parliament shall establish a local government commission. So it is not a constitutional commission, but simply a statutory tribunal. Even that, Mr. Ford misinterprets. And I think the other point that Mr. Ford harangues the people with is the issue about the statement of expenditure was not properly done. Well, I, first of all, I believe that it is the first time that we are doing a statement of expenditure in Guyana. 
we did statements of excesses before. That is when you have an appropriation act and you spend beyond what is appropriated. So you go and you lay what is called a statement of excess. And that's catered for in 218 of the Constitution. What we have now is where there is no appropriation act and there has been spending. In that instance, you produce what is called a statement of expenditure. That is what the Constitution has. And that is what we have done. So Mr. Ford's arguments are completely without merit, absolutely frivolous, and in the same nature and character of the type of arguments which he has advanced before the courts over the last five months. That is what I would like to say at this point in time. Thank you.